This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by the Bitfinity Conference taking place in Miami Beach from October 30th to November 2nd. Join industry thought leaders, investors, and leading blockchain companies to discuss and showcase how they will use blockchains in a wide range of industries. Go to bitfinity.com slash epicenter for discounts on registrations and exhibitor packages. And by Jax. Jax is a user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Kyle Torpy. Now, I've been aware of Kyle Torpy for two and a half years or, or almost as long as I've gotten into, into this whole area. He's an excellent writer and journalist about Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, blockchain technologies, decentralized technologies. Uh, there's not a lot of them, but there's a few. And, and Kyle certainly, I think, is the one that stands out to me the most in terms of having like really in-depth, well-researched and intelligent uh, writings about these topics. So he's writing uh, currently for Bitcoin Magazine and Coin Journal, but he's also written for all kinds of other publications. And of course, we'll be linking to quite a few of his articles in the show notes as well. So uh, thanks so much for coming on, Kyle. Thanks for having me. Thanks for that uh, intro. One of the reasons also why we wanted to have you on, besides, of course, having been fans of your work for a long time, is that we've not been doing so much coverage about uh, Bitcoin. And, and partially it's also because we feel, well, there's a few reasons. One is that there's just not as many new projects, it seems, to talk about. And another thing is also that we are just not quite as in the loop anymore. So this is going to be a great chance to kind of talk about Bitcoin, talk about a lot of the things that have been going on around Bitcoin, a lot of the important debates and, and topics. And, and Kyle has been specifically also writing about that, writing about you know, everything from scalability to the new, uh, the new things happening in Bitcoin core development. I think also if, like last, maybe like six or seven months ago, we were just talking about scalability, scalability all the time. And at some point, I think we were both like, let's, let's talk about something else for a while. But yeah, it'd be good to get a, a bit of an update on, on what's happening and uh, you know, what, 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 what we can expect to coming to Bitcoin NFL in the coming months. So to start off, um, yeah, as Sebastian said, we often talked about scalability. Can you give us just your perspective of, on a very high level? What is what is being debated here, and what have the different, the most important stages been in that debate? So this debate has been going on for years, even since the earlier days of Bitcoin when everything was going on in IRC, and then it finally came to a head when we started getting closer to the one mega megabyte block size limit, and that's when Gavin and my current decided to do, uh, first it was BIP 101, and then they couldn't get it into core, so they tried to fork with Bitcoin XT. That didn't work, and then they tried to fork with Classic. That hasn't worked. And now it seems like uh, the core roadmap from December of last year is still what's being pushed forward. Um, there's not really, there, there's some dissenting viewpoints, but they're not really gaining much traction among the miners uh, who would have to activate the hard fork eventually. But there is there is a small community that still wants the uh, the hard fork. I mean, one of the things that comes to my mind when you say these things, of course, is also that a lot of the people who wanted the hard fork may just have left and disengaged a little bit because it seems like a very small number of people essentially control core development. They're not going to, uh, and they're against it, right? They they uh, think the better way forward is not a hard fork and that uh, there's certainly reasons for that. But then uh, there doesn't seem any way to have a voice in this process, right? So at some point you just say, well, right, uh, let's step back. So I think, you know, Mike Kern has essentially left the Bitcoin community. Uh, Gavin and Dreesen, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, he's certainly not very present anymore. 
Um, and I think the same is true for a lot of people. So to say uh, most people agree on not doing a hard fork is, I, I think it's a little bit yeah, of a problematic I, statement. I, I think um, with, with Bitcoin, you have to get a consensus, not like, not necessarily social consensus, but you know, the, the network runs in consensus all the time. So making any change to the network is going to be extremely difficult, especially when we're at a $10 billion market cap and people want to be very conservative about changes to the code. So uh, it's, it's true that these people didn't get their viewpoints uh, or their philosophies merged into Bitcoin Core, but that, that happens with everyone. I mean, if you, just because your viewpoint doesn't get merged today doesn't necessarily... I mean, I, I should put this a different way. Uh, you can't expect Bitcoin to be what you want it to be. It's it's what it's what it was from the start, and changes to that are going to be extremely difficult. So so we're going to, we're going to speak a lot more about uh, hard forks in a bit. But around this scalability rate, one of the events that got a lot of attention at the time was this thing called the Hong Kong Consensus. And I, to be honest, I don't perfectly remember what exactly it was. But would you mind just uh, running us through what happened back then? Uh, and what the kind of outcome, larger outcome of that was. Sure. So there was a meeting in Hong Kong between some of the miners in China and some of the Bitcoin core developers, but not all of them. Uh, and Adam Back, who is, I guess is, wasn't a core developer at the time, but he's the president of Blockstream. So they came to the consensus and decided that the plan would be to essentially continue with the core roadmap, put out segregated witness, but also put forth code that would eventually activate a hard fork for increasing the block size limit. And there was a lot of controversy because some people in the community thought the core developers that were there broke their promise essentially to release hard fork code and also the SegWit code, because it got delayed. But there wasn't actually any promise of when any of that code would be released. It was more of just like a estimate of like the scheduling of when it would happen. So now we're at a point where segregated witness is about to be, well, it's already put into zero point, version 0.13 of Bitcoin Core. An activation code should be merged relatively shortly. And I, I mean, the core developers who were said they were going to create code for the hard fork are still working on it. I remember uh, Peter Todd had a meeting with some of the other developers in New York where they were putting, they were trying to figure out what they were going to put in the hard fork besides the uh, block size limit increase. But the thing is, like, the, they can't speak for the entire uh, community of Bitcoin Core developers. So they can make a pull request, but it doesn't necessarily have to get merged. There was also a point where uh, Jihan Wu from Antpool said that he might delay uh, the activation of segregated witness if that hard fork code wasn't also available. But my sense is that, uh, I haven't confirmed this with him, but my sense is that, that that's no longer the case, which makes sense because they basically, he, segregated witness also includes an increase to the block size limit effectively. So they'd basically be blocking the very thing that they want. So it wouldn't really make much sense. So amongst the proposals for increasing the capacity, the scaling capacity of Bitcoin. Uh, so segregated witness, uh, just as you mentioned, just came out, uh, was merged in version 0 0.13. Uh, we're still waiting for miners to vote for that to be activated. We can talk about that in just a bit. Um, what are some of the other uh, possible solutions being 
explored or debated in order to raise this, raise the the transaction limit even higher because I think I read somewhere that the effective um, scalability increases was somewhat to the order of 1.7 megabytes per block with segregated witness. If if Bitcoin is to become successful, as I think most of us agree it should, uh, we'll probably need much more than that. So what what are some of the other uh, proposals being put forth in order to you know be able to do like you know, thousands of transactions? hundreds if not thousands of transactions per, te- per second potentially so there are a lot of different things that are being worked on right now some of them are mainly focused on rather than increasing the capacity fitting more transactions inside the capacity that we have right now that's kind of what segregated witness does that's also what schnorr signatures kind of do where they just they make transactions smaller so you can fit more of them in a block essentially. So just on that, I'm curious, uh, how big of an effect is that with Schnorr signatures? And would Schnorr signatures also require a hard fork, or is it possible to do that, for example, uh, with segregated witness? Uh, at once, I'm not sure if uh, Schnorr requires SegWit, but it. Uh, Effectively, it, it would. I think it would increase the capacity by a third, but I'd, I'd have to double check. Uh, Aaron at Bitcoin Magazine did a really good article on uh, Schnorr signatures a few months ago, so I would definitely check that out. And actually, a side effect of Schnorr is that it could actually incentivize people to use CoinJoin transactions because uh, the way it works is when you combine your transactions with multisig, they actually become smaller as opposed to like a bunch of different transactions being put being put in a block. If you combine them in multi-sig, then it, it lowers the overall size of the transactions, which means uh, lower fees would, you'd be paying lower fees for your transactions. So you're actually incentivized to mix your, uh, or use coin join transactions. But that's only one of, there's, a, there's another, uh, this is more like very early uh, days, but there's, there's this concept of signature aggregation, which has become, which ca- first came up like publicly with the uh, recent California meeting where the miners and the developers went out to California and they made one stop at Stanford for a cryptography talk. And I forget the professor's name, but the professor at Stanford was talking about signature aggregation, where you basically, in a similar way to Schnorr, you combine the transactions' uh, signatures together. So instead of having like hundreds or thousands of signatures per block for transactions, you combine them all together and you only have one, uh, it's like one effective signature, uh, transaction signature in the block. And that's what, uh, I don't know if you guys saw the Mimblewimble proposal for privacy, but I, I believe that also uses that technology. What was the name of that proposal? Uh, I don't, I don't think it had like a specific name. It's just a general concept of signature aggregation. Uh, I wasn't familiar with that, uh, with that paper. Um, but so all of these solutions, uh, these proposed solutions, are are interesting because they they I think solve the short term problem of scalability by adding some capacity, but also like, if you take Seg Witness for example, is like a clear optimization of the protocol uh, and also fixes some other problems like transaction malleability. But so what are what what are sort of core developers and the people attending these conferences, uh, these scaling these scaling um, uh, workshops? What are they expecting, or what what types of things do they expect from the protocol if it were to scale like you know, massively? Uh, are are they sort of betting on offloading transactions on things like the Lightning Network, or do they ex- is there some sort of expectation that Bitcoin should the core protocol should um, handle the bulk of these transactions? Right. So in addition to the parts I just talked about, where you're basically stuffing more transactions into each block that seems, stays the same size. Uh, side chains and Lightning Network are also being worked on. And Lightning seems to be the 
the thing that everyone's betting on. Although I know Jeff Garzik seems to think that uh, side chains might actually be better for uh, micro payments and things like that. Uh, and it's also, I mean, root rootstock is mostly viewed as like an uh, Ethereum spinoff, but it, it it also increases capacity to 300 transactions per second uh, via sidechain. So, I mean, that's sidechains can be used that way to like basically put put those micro payments or payments that don't need as much security onto another chain. And the way Rootstock is starting it, their sidechain, it's it's not going to be merged mined at first. It's a federated uh, model where they have a bunch of Bitcoin companies basically signing the transactions. I guess what you're saying is just, so there's sort of a general consensus that Bitcoin should scale horizontally and not necessarily vertically. Is Have have the core developers sort of come around that idea? They definitely don't want to increase the block size limit right away. So, and there isn't really another way to... I mean, when you're talking about exponential scalability, I think something like Lightning is... or um, uh, side chains for micropayments is going to have to be the answer. It, it, it just, it's not going to be able to work otherwise. So there's going to, the, essentially there's going to need, need to be some kind of trade-off where some transactions don't have the same level of security as like the core main blockchain. Like as a lot of people say, like you don't need the entire Bitcoin network to confirm your coffee purchase at Starbucks in the morning, necessarily. So people who actually need uh, that censorship resistant quality of Bitcoin, they can still use the main Bitcoin blockchain. But if, say, like, say uh, Lightning was activated tomorrow, I think a lot of the network would move there just because a lot of the network is still like people moving money between exchanges or to and from exchanges. So you're basically taking all of that off the blockchain completely and you're leaving uh, the core blockchain for uh, those censorship resistant regulatory arbitrage use cases that people actually need Bitcoin for. Let's take a short break to talk about Bitfinity, the Miami blockchain conference to be held this year from October 30th until November 2nd. Blockchain technology has been exiting the world of nerds and hackers and entering the mainstream. We're at the beginning of a big revolution that's going to fundamentally change how the world works. At the Bitfinity conference, we're going to have the heavyweight speakers such as Don Tapscott, who wrote the book The Blockchain Revolution, or Joe Lubin of the Startup Consensus. But we're also going to have the industry panels that focus on real-world use cases and bring together both the tech expert, who really understand blockchain, and the kind of key decision makers that will help blockchain become a real commercial success. Now, you may just want to pack your bags and buy a ticket to Miami, and that's certainly a good idea. But if you're involved in a project or startup, there's something even better. Bitfinity will feature dozens of presentations by starting startups, so you can apply for the presenter package, get an exhibitor stand, and speak on the main stage to an audience of 500 to 1,000 high-level people, including many VCs and top decision makers. And of course, all that while sipping a martini in a luxury hotel in Miami Beach where Frank Sinatra once sang on stage. To learn more how you can join startups like Factum, Consensus, Everledger, and Stellar. Visit them at bitfinity.com slash epicenter and find out how you can get 10% off the company presenter package or your $200 discount code to attend. We'd like to thank Bitfinity for their support of Epicenter. So we have sidechains and uh, Lightning Network, integrated witness, etc. There are certainly some things happening. That being said, I think it was maybe two years ago that we had Mike Hearn on this podcast and he said something that got a lot of attention at the time, which is he said that Bitcoin uh, development had ground to a halt and that not a lot was happening. And, and you know, famously, uh, he left the community afterwards. And since then, others have come out in a similar vein. For example, there was recently a post by uh, Brian Armstrong, I think, of Coinbase or, or Fred Urson, maybe it was. Uh, also arguing that actually today uh, in Ethereum you have much more um, 
a much more quick progress, much more activity. And I think that's certainly the perception of a lot of people. Now, you having, you know, following this very closely, what's your opinion? Do you think that Bitcoin development has, uh, you know, has it kept pace? Has it decreased in, in its pace compared to, let's say, two years ago? Has it increased? And, and how is that compared to, let's say, Ethereum at this point? I think with any of these uh, public blockchains, Bitcoin has just kind of run the course of how development works. Because like in the early days, obviously, it was just Satoshi doing whatever he wanted. And he could update it whenever he wanted and release uh Upgrades and then Gavin took over and he had the same kind of like benevolent dictator role on the protocol. And then when he left around that time is when it was probably a little after, but that's when Bitcoin like everyone realized it's a thing and it's it's probably gonna stick around for a while and the market cap shot up. So once once you have all these new people coming into the ecosystem, then it's a lot harder to make a change that doesn't uh, compromise a minority of users or like what their philosophy on what Bitcoin is. It's like a general progression. So like obviously Ethereum and all these other altcoins or blockchains can, they can be a lot more flexible just like Bitcoin was in its early days because they just don't have the wide user base that Bitcoin does. But, but back to the question, do you think that, uh, so, so you think initially there's a lot of flexibility with, you know, Satoshi and, and Gavin and, and a lot of, I guess, changes because of that. And that then, I guess, around when Gavin stepped back, a lot of new people came in and there was not so much agreement and progress slowed down. And do you think now that essentially, you know, people around Blockstream control a lot of the development uh do you think that has uh, accelerated again well i wouldn't say new people came in like to the development process but it was definitely a change in how the development process worked when vlad took over because he he was he was much more conservative and he would only make changes if they had completely wide consensus uh that still seems to be the case like that's still how it works and a lot of the core developers view this as a good thing i know some people don't but it, it again it like it emphasizes the decentralization of the network when it's extremely difficult to make a change it's a much better sign for decentralization when you're not able to fork the chain and reverse the uh, implications or the actions of a smart contract you see, that does not make sense to me. So if, if you had a large proportion of the network, there's certainly a large proportion of the community, right, that were, for example, in favor of a block size increase, there was certainly a significant majority that were in favor of that at some point. And then that didn't happen essentially because of centralization, right? Because there is so much power in a small set of developers, many of, you know, a significant number of them uh, paid by Blockstream and employed by Blockstream. And that's a sign of decentralization because you couldn't make an upgrade. I mean, I would agree with you that in the case of Ethereum, they were able to do this fork because of centralization to an extent. But it seems to me that in Bitcoin, there's no fork also because of centralization of development. The, I think the point here is that democracy is also a form of centralization, right? You're allowing the majority to be the centralized controller of what should happen. Instead, in Bitcoin, it, it's more decentralized because even the majority cannot force the minority into a change that they don't want. Does that make sense? Yeah, it sort of makes sense, although I don't think it's an act. I wouldn't look at it as an accurate description of what's going on, no, because it you have... Not more, not as much decentralization as with democracy, but you have less decentralization because there's a small set of essentially the core developers, which are whatever is five, seven people or something that have a lot of power. And of course, they cannot do it all on their own, and then they need miners to buy in, etc. Right, but the point is they're not 
forcing their change to the protocol on other people. They're sticking with what the protocol is. Like they're they're starting with they're sticking with what it is. They're not changing it. Yes, right. No, no, that's well, it's true to 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 much extent, right? Although, of course, with segregated witness, they have made some changes. Which, in case of segregated witness, I guess was fairly uncontroversial, and people were in general in agreement that this was a good thing. If I can jump in, I think it's also really important to point out that it's pretty much impossible to judge consensus on these networks. As like that's another thing that Ethereum hard fork showed. Like they said, they took a, like a vote of like the coin vote and the miner vote or whatever, and but it was actually a very small segment of the people who own Ethereum or mine Ethereum that voted, and it had like eighty five percent support. I think I don't remember the exact number, and then everyone said, oh. This Ethereum Classic thing isn't going to be a thing at all. It's good. We're going to fork, and it's just going to be like nothing happened. And they forked, and within hours, everyone was like popping. Uh, I remember seeing pictures on Twitter of Ethereum developers popping champagne and patting themselves on the back, and Brian Armstrong and Gavin Andreessen jumping to say that like this proves that we should be hard forking right now. And then Poloniex lists. Ethereum Classic, and the story changes. <laughs> Today's magic word is insider. That's I-N-S-I-D-E-R. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So we mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the core client uh, 0 0.13 just came out. And there's a certain number of uh, updates to this client. Notably, the most important one is Segregated Witness, uh, which we've been waiting for for a long time and enables a lot of new things. So it, like like you mentioned, it enables Lightning Network and also fixes some, uh, some problems. Uh, can you talk about, uh, well, what this means essentially for the network? I mean, what type of... of, of uh, uh, what is the advantage of having segregated witness and also what other things uh, are included in this new release? Segwit includes a variety of uh, advantages. Like I mentioned, the 1.7 megabyte effective block size increase. But it also changes the way that uh, the developers can completely change the uh, scripting, Bitcoin scripting system. So it makes it much easier to uh, add new opcodes to the system. Uh, and Johnson Lau is currently working on uh, a proposal called MAST that enables a few new opcodes and re-enables uh, some old ones. Uh, it also fixes transaction malleability, which is what enables the Lightning Network and things like that to exist. Uh, for those who remember, transaction malleability is also what Mark Carpellis blamed uh, those uh, with the when people basically like when Mt. Cox was losing all those bitcoins, he was blaming it on transaction malleability. Uh, it also enables fraud proofs, which uh, could be useful for uh, in improving the security of SPV clients. But that, there's a lot more research that still needs to be done there. But uh, the general sense that I get from the core development team is like they're all extremely excited about this. And uh, BIP9, which is uh, called it's version bits, because it allows them to uh, make upgrades to Bitcoin and make it a more powerful system with where you can make more powerful smart contracts. And it makes that process of adding new features to Bitcoin uh, much more fluid and uh, much simpler. Right. Can we come back on this? Is I remember, I can't remember which episode it was we did, uh, where we talked about segregated witness uh, into de in detail, but... It was with the one with... Um, I think it was Eric, Eric Lombroso. Yeah, Eric Lombroso. Right, yeah. right, right, right. And so I'd like you to, to come back on this, uh, on this last point. 
and how it enables uh, new opcodes to be tested? I'm not sure how it works technically, but I know I've talked to Johnson Lau, who is working on uh, enabling new opcodes and re-enabling the old ones through uh, a bit called MAST, which uh, will essentially it will enable some new uh, smart contract features that for Bitcoin. And like he was, he essentially told me that he would not have been able to make these changes to Bitcoin without the addition of segregated witness. So that, and, and as far as I'm aware, he's he's like relatively new developer to the uh, core development team, but I'd, I'd have to double check that last point. Okay, and so then, um... Now that it's been merged and it's in, in, in this latest version and people are updating their clients, uh, I mean, all, all wallets, I guess, are going to have to uh, you know, now update uh, their code base to support segregated witness. And the next step then is for miners to uh, accept this new version of the code. Um, how long do you think that process will take until we see this actually, well, we see like, you know, these new segregated witness transactions uh, occur on the network? So uh, the code for segregated witness is already in the Bitcoin core client. It was added in 0 0.13, but the code to activate or signal support for segregated witness is coming in the next version, which will be 0 0.13.1. And it, it seems like that's uh, close to being released. Maybe if I had to guess, I would say in the next month or so it would be released. So the next step after that would be uh, all the 95% of the miners have to signal support for this change to the protocol. And then, as you said, also the, the wallet developers also have to upgrade their wallets for this change, but I think the difficulty of doing that has been uh, overblown, at least because uh, Nicholas Doyer, who uh, he controls or he runs the N Bitcoin uh, library, and he's already implemented SegWit into that, and I believe Bitcoin J's pretty pretty much done that as well but I have to check I, I think with the right amount of assistance from people familiar with segwit that I mean I mean I've talked to Eric Lombroso a lot who you guys have had on the show and he says he's been able to implement it in wallets in only a few days and I know like you have, you have to have a lot more testing and everything with when you're talking about a live network, but I, I think I don't know if it's going to take as long as some people are making it out to be. I think I think the real uh, issue will be the activation from miners. I think that's that's what might take even longer. We'll now, have to see. Well, you know, let's say in in, in some amount of time, you know, uh, most transactions uh, on the Bitcoin network are now uh, SegWit transactions. Uh, can we expect to see some? Uh, well, now that we'll, you know, we'll have more higher effective block size, can we expect to see transaction fees to go down? Is that uh, uh, an, a potential uh, outcome here? Is that miners would get less transaction fees? Well, the miners could get to set whatever fees they want. Uh, so it depends. I mean, it depends on how many more transactions happen on the network, too. I imagine fees might go down a bit since, at least at first, since we won't be hitting the... Uh, the effective block size limit, but uh, once yeah, once you hit the limit, that's when the fee market kicks in, and those who really want their transaction confirmed right away have to pay a higher fee. So they yeah, it just depends on how many transactions are going to be on the network once this uh, segwit is activated. Okay, so let's talk about then the, the roadmap. Uh, what's coming in? What's expected to come in the new next versions of Bitcoin? So by the way, it's like, is there somewhere where 
because I, I certainly don't know where, but where we can see the roadmap for development, like what's coming in version 0.14, 0.15, etc. Uh, there's a general outline on bitcoincore.org. It, it all stems from a post Greg Maxwell made on the uh, mailing list after I think it was scaling Bit- Bitcoin Hong Kong, uh, where he laid out uh, everything that he and others thought they should do, and then everyone just kind of uh, ag- agreed or disagreed on the mailing list, and they eventually came to consensus that like this is what we're going to do going forward. As far as other changes that are being made, uh, Compact Blocks was also included in uh, version 0.13 of Bitcoin Core, which I believe is similar to an idea called IBLT that Gavin Andreessen used to was working on a two one or two years ago, and the idea is to basically make sure that transactions on the network aren't sent twice to lower the overall amount of bandwidth needed. And it also so like when you send out a transaction, uh, that transaction essentially gets sent around the network again once the block is mined because it's included in that block. So this is a way to like when someone when a miner mines a block, it'll get sent out to the network, and it'll just kind of like if you already have, because if you already have a bunch, all these transactions in your uh, mempool, you don't need to it, the the miner doesn't need to let you know about those transactions. So it's a way to like limit the amount of data that needs to be sent around the network, and then that's more about bandwidth. And then with uh, Matt Corello's Relay network was also recently improved to be faster and more decentralized. And that really helps the issue of latency, which has really been the main, one of the main uh, things preventing Bitcoin from scaling uh, higher because it, it, it essentially gives advantages to the biggest miners if when you mine a block, it takes a long time for everyone else to learn about that block on the network. The Lightning Network is also possible. And I remember Joseph Poon saying, who's one of the Lightning co-authors who you guys had on the show, I think, he said that basically that the Lightning Network will be ready for at least testing on the live network whenever Segregated Witness is activated. So his original... Uh, estimate was the summertime, but SegWit's taken taken a bit longer. So whenever that's uh, activated, we'll get to play around with the Lightning Network. So the Lightning Network actually will be use usable on Bitcoin when Segregated Witness is is out. I mean, of course, I know I know there's a whole bunch of other stuff that has to happen in terms of the Lightning Network nodes, and and there's some complexity there, and the wallets have to integrate it, etc. But at least from Bitcoin's perspective, uh, that at that point one can go ahead. Yeah, uh, SegWit is the last change that's needed for Lightning and other things. There's a bunch of different payment channel related proposals, but Lightning's just the most popular one. But yeah, SegWit is the last uh, change that's needed before those can be uh, workable on the Bitcoin network because they because SegWit fixes transaction malleability. Do you know if like payment service providers and wallet uh, developers are doing anything to prepare for uh, the Lightning Network uh, to be uh, to be ready? Uh, I haven't confirmed that with anyone, but I know a lot of uh, wallet developers are excited about it. But I, I, I think uh, I'm more familiar with wallets already integrating segregated witness than I am. Uh, the Lightning Network. Yeah, I suppose it probably is a bit early. Um, uh, before we move on to the next topic, uh, let's 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 come back to uh, to another topic which uh, we uh, had discussed earlier, which was the the having. So uh, I guess it's been about two months since uh, uh, we had the uh, block size, uh, sorry, the block reward uh, having. So it went from uh, from twenty five to twelve point five bitcoins, and at the time, you know, there was. Um, uh, a lot of discussion around what would happen. It was sort of a you know, much anticipated event, and uh, 
And just, I mean, sort of like, you know, like Y2K, you know, like what's going to happen after the halving kind of thing. And, um, and now two months later, uh, well, Bitcoin is still running. Um, you know, miners have not, I guess, I think so, have not turned off their hardware like massively. Uh, where, you know, so what, what basically uh, happened you know, in these last two months uh, in your, from your perspective? Yeah, I didn't think it would have much effect at all. And it didn't when the having actually took place, but there was that run up in the price before uh, the having happened. So I don't, uh, it might've been related to having, I'm not really sure. Uh, the hash rate is actually higher. I, I was checking it last night. I think it's higher or around the same as it was before the having. Um, and I talked to some of the miners before the having took place, and none of them were really worried. I think they 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 thought like a slight decrease in the hash rate might have been uh, possible, which we did see at first, but now it's already recovered. Uh, it's important to remember that they all these like Bitfury and. Uh, Bitmain, they just came out with like brand new mining chips that people are were buying in like December and early this year. So it's not like they're going to buy these, spend all this capital to buy these chips in December and then turn them off like six months later. That's like these, those brand new, uh, that's, this is like a long-term play. And a lot of the miners are also holding Bitcoin. So they're, not necessarily uh, if they're long Bitcoin, they're not necessarily worried about short-term price movements. But yeah, it's been since the having, it's been like pretty non-event, I'd say. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is a multi-coin wallet created by the people at Decentral. Now, in the past, if you had a whole bunch of cryptocurrencies, it was a pain to handle them. You either had to leave them on an exchange which was insecure, or you had to have all these different wallets, which was a hassle. Fortunately, now with Jax, those medieval days of darkness, misery, and suffering are over. Jax supports multiple cryptocurrencies and new ones are being added. But it's not just storing cryptocurrencies you can do with Jax, but you can also exchange them directly from within inside the wallet thanks to their Shapeshift integration. And since there's only one seed, Jax makes it super easy to back up and sync to your other devices. Jax works with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and has browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome. So go to jax.io, that's J A X X.io, to download the wallet and get started today. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. We've talked a little bit before about forking, and I want to come back to that topic uh, to some extent. So you mentioned how hard it was for Ethereum to assess or to know really, you know, what what did the people think, the the holders of Ethereum, the coins think, the currency or the miners, etc. And that's certainly true, right? They had some polls, but it, there was such low participation that you couldn't really make inferences overall. So I, th I think that's a very accurate description, and the to an extent, the same thing is true in Bitcoin. But don't you think that exactly that is why forks are so essential? Because they're really the only way of seeing which, uh, you know, which alternative prevails, which one is strong, or which one really has the support of, of the coin holders, also the miners, etc. Right? Because, for example, with Ethereum, um, there's a very powerful way uh, to do that, no? Because all of a sudden you had Ethereum and now you have uh, ETH and Ethereum Classic, right? So I, as a user and an Ethereum holder, now I have a voice here. I can say I'm going to sell one and get the other, right? So, and then I don't just have a voice, but I also have an incentive to make that bet and say, okay, which one's going to succeed in the future? And now with Bitcoin, right, there's also this debate, like what's the right way forward? Should there be a block size increase or not? And people like me, for example, hold some Bitcoins, don't really have anything to say here. But if you had a fork and you had two versions, well, you could have that say. And also miners, right? They could choose where they direct their hash rate. So don't you think that a fork is really an essential way for, uh, for decentralized uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and communities to 
to evolve the protocol and, and make those kind of decisions? I think it, when it comes to hard forks, it might not be the best thing to compare Ethereum to Bitcoin because they're basically trying to do two different things. Bitcoin's trying to be this bearer e-cash or digital gold, a store of value. So really, it's just it's just about holding that value and making sure nothing disrupts that. And when you you do a hard fork, you're you're basically creating going from one network to two networks. So now the, whatever network it, network effect advantage your chain had is now perhaps decreased because now you're you're split into two different networks for for your thing that's supposed to be like a store of value. So. I think it, it, it creates a lot of complexities with people who just want to uh, store, have this store of value that they know is going to be, or they believe is going to be gaining value over time, and they don't want to deal with uh, separate chains and, and things like that. I think I, I agree with you on that point uh, where you know, Bitcoin as a store of value, if, if you know, if you have uh, some sort of a forking event and and all of a sudden, uh, you know, the price of Bitcoin goes down or, you know, goes down by half. And so that that's massively has a massive impact on the ecosystem. Uh, then again, I, I think that in, in order for innovation to happen, you know, disruption does in some cases uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, help in innovation move forward. And perhaps at this point, uh, because it is quite early in Bitcoin's, uh, you know, life, you know, it's only been around for, you know, less than 10 years. Uh, may maybe now is the time to, you know, you know, get that disruption going by having sort of these really hard shocks to the network uh, with hard forks, etc. Um, so that innovation can occur. And then whatever, you know, whatever the network effect uh is you know whatever network effect happens to you know, towards one chain or another would sort of happen naturally. I don't know what what do you guys think about that? I think it's helpful if everyone is building on the same chain too, just for the purposes of network effects. Like it, it would be helpful if everyone was building on Bitcoin in some way. I think I think that's really all I have to add to that. Yeah, that's certainly true. Although I think if you look at let's even if you say look at something like Ethereum and and the fork there, which didn't you know certainly wasn't ideally executed, and and probably the conservative Bitcoin developers would do a, you know a more thorough job in in something like that. But uh, even there, right? You you really very quickly had you didn't have a division. Uh, on the level of developers, right? There was maybe a few new ones like uh, Charles Hoskinson that said, okay, now we're going to get engaged, do something ETC. But most developers, they, you know, they just kept with ETH, even though there was a market, a significant market cap for ETC. I mean, I, I think always the the idea that there would be a, an ongoing split of the community is... I, I, I think the networks are there and there's a strong incentive to sort of align around a winner. Quite yeah, but quickly. Ethereum fork for different reasons. Ethereum fork because of a, a, a sort of a massive hack on the system and it was a reactionary event, whereas the, uh, you know, the, the discussion around forking for Bitcoin is around, you know, um, around implementing features which would allow the network to either su su succeed or fail and and it's all it's all really about an uncertainty i think to this point i mean uh, there's a lot of uncertainty on whether uh, you know increasing the block size would cause more centralization etc and i think that the yeah the, the reason for forking is completely different and that's what i mean when i say that it it, it could provoke innovation where you know if we test these things out then we we know okay we know we did this hard fork we know it failed and then so we have this other version uh, that we can always move back to yeah, that's a really good point, and uh, that's why when it, I mean when it comes to uh, the reasons for forking on Ethereum and Bitcoin are really different, and the, like I'm not even sure if I think the uh, the network effects would be more towards like if Bitcoin tried to if someone tried to fork Bitcoin like they did Ethereum to two megabyte blocks, I don't think that would be enough for a community to start around two megabyte blocks. With Ethereum, it was pretty much 
the, philosoph the philosophy that the chain should be as immutable as possible, which is a very core, like, belief on public blockchains. So it was pretty obvious, at least to me and a few others, that there was going to be two chains after the fork happened. Just because that's such, that's, you're creating that's such a differing philosophy that, uh, that some people definitely aren't going to go along with the uh, bailed out chain or whatever you want to call it. And I, I also think it's important to point out that Ethereum Classic is actually the original Ethereum chain. And when you think about it, it, what we call Ethereum now is actually kind of an altcoin of what we call Ethereum Classic. Because it just kind of took the ledger, made a change, and started from scratch. It has the bigger market cap now, but Ethereum Classic is the is the uh, original chain still. Well, so that depends how you define it, right? If you look at it in, in sort of through the lens of this immutability uh, above everything then yes right but if you look at it for example in terms of community then uh eth in ethereum is the original community right so i mean i think this depends a lot on where one focuses and, and how one looks at this right. but i think the immutability is why we're here though when it, at least when it comes to public blockchains so if you want to have like uh a, a public blockchain based on democracy, I don't think you really need proof of work, maybe. Like, you might be better to have some type of election or something and have notaries on, like, signing blocks on the ledger or something. Or just use fiat. Well, <laughs> so a lot, a lot to discuss here. I mean, first of all, immutability is certainly a, a very important aspect of, of public blockchain. There's no question about that. And I think... Uh, uh, it is essential, right? Now, of course, there's sort of the question whether it is one factor of many or whether it is the, you know, the absolute one thing that can never be compromised. And personally, I would think it's, it's one factor, but it has to be balanced against other factors. I think it goes back to what we were, the, t the differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin too, where immutability is definitely a lot more important on uh, Bitcoin because it's supposed to be this bearer e-cash, right? Ethereum's like a platform for smart contracts, so maybe, I mean, it might it, mutability might not be as important. I, I don't, I don't know, for, but it definitely seems like it'd be of the utmost importance on uh, on Bitcoin because it's it, it's just trying to be money. It's just, it's just it's trying to be cash. So like you can't reverse transactions or anything. Yeah, I certainly agree. There can be different weights as well, and and, and Bitcoin has put a, a lot of weight on the immutability aspect and and one can yeah argue whether whether that to what extent that makes sense and to what extent it doesn't make sense um it's certainly true that if you look at the idea of bitcoin being this digital gold type thing then stability is very important and uh hard fork would most certainly add uh, uncertainty and from that point, it is a, is a risk, right? So you have to balance that sort of against maybe saying, but you get more scalability, you get more innovation, et cetera. So there's, it's, it's not a necessarily an easy uh, trade-off to make. There's a lot of different systems that could uh, offer a lower amount of decentralization and kind of do what Ethereum is trying to do. Like, uh, I know you can do... People have been talking about open transactions for a really long time, but that company, there's a company, Stash, run by Chris Odom, that is finally actually developing something with it. And uh, you can do smart contracts on a system of federated servers with that software. So that might also, that might be another way to do the trade off. And you don't need a, like a separate Ether token for, to use that platform. So there's a, there's a lot of different ways you can get that trade-off. So let's come to our last topic, which is the, the kind of topic of where is Bitcoin at? Like, is it reaching, is it making progress uh, in terms of becoming more widely adopted and reaching this mainstream, which is, uh, is a topic that has often come up. So 
before this episode, actually, I went back and I looked at some of our earliest episodes and I looked at some of the topics, uh, some of the companies that were and projects that we talked about back then. So let me give uh, uh, just read out four of the earliest ones. So one was Hive. Hive was a, a wallet which has recently been suspended. And Neo and B we talked about once on the show. Uh, very early on, and Neon B, for those who don't know, was uh, the Cyprus-based uh, Bitcoin bank type thing that got a lot of attention and turned out turned out to be some sort of scam. Uh, Yellow Pay, which was a payments company, uh, Bitcoin payments, kind of like BitPay a little bit in the Middle East. They also just closed down. Swarm. Uh, also had lots of uh, lots of claims, but I think that project is pretty much dead. So uh, all of those are kind of gone, and that's certainly quite representative from if you look at projects back then. So you you mentioned uh, kind of when we talked before the show uh, some mainstream applications that are now launching that maybe have a chance to make it uh, you know make it big and get a whole lot of users. So I mentioned some like Abra, Yours, Open Bazaar, Purse. Why do you think those have a shot? What's different now from two years ago? The main value proposition of Bitcoin is regulatory arbitrage or getting around regulations, things like that. And I've been thinking about this recently. A lot of these apps that are coming out like uh, Yours, Abra, Brave, Purse even, pop chest. It doesn't look like it at first, but they actually do still involve regulatory arbitrage in that uh, the the process of being being a payment processor and complying with all these regulations when you're a custodian of funds is so it costs so much to be compliant that uh, the, you can't really do microtransactions without Bitcoin. And I recently talked to Andrew Lee from Purse about this because I was wondering, like, why why does your platform actually need Bitcoin? Why couldn't you just do this with, like, PayPal even or anything like that? And it's, it's, it's because he, he sent me back this document that was, like, a few thousand pages long, and it was from Visa, and it was, like, their version of, irreversible micropayments and he's like well we'd have to comply with this and it could change at any time and it's and it's also when you're a centralized payment system sometimes you're you say you're not reversible until you the government comes in and says you have to reverse a payment which is i think that happened with uh okay pay uh back in the day with because they had some mount gox funds and uh I remember early in the days of Bitcoin, there was also this exchange called Trade Hill, where you used to be able to make deposits with uh, Dwala. And then apparently Dwala told Trade Hill that uh, they don't need to worry about their customers like depositing via Dwala and then taking Bitcoin from the exchange and then reversing the Dwala transaction. They were basically saying it's irreversible. And then Dwala realize, I guess you can't really do that in the United States. So they based, uh, Trade Hill basically had to shut down because people deposited with Dwala, traded it for Bitcoin, and then reversed all their Dwala transactions. But uh, yeah, so uh, basically a lot of these apps that are coming online now involve micropayments in some way. So you got uh, yours, who I, I just saw you guys interviewed maybe last this week or last week, uh, the project from Ryan X Charles, where you're basically, it's basically a content, a monetization platform for content creators, uh, and their audiences can just like upvote them. It's a very simplified way of putting it, but just upvoting with Bitcoin, basically. Uh, Brave is doing a similar thing with content monetization, only it's a browser. And it's actually, it's actually the browser I use every day now. So even if it didn't have Bitcoin in it, I would, I'd still want to use it because it's, it's blocking. It's like an ad blocker browser, basically. And then you can choose to send payments instead of looking at ads. And then PopChest is another one where 
they actually did an experiment with this guy, Nerd Rage, who's like a YouTube celebrity. I don't really watch his stuff, but he has like hundreds of thousands of subs subscribers, and he decided to try out Pop Chest, and he made more money on Pop Chest by charging like 25 cents per view or something like that than he did, than he would have on uh, YouTube advertisements. And one, one last point on the mainstream applications, I think Abra, if they do it right, could be the first mainstream uh, Bitcoin wallet because they're essentially, there's no volatility involved. They're hiding Bitcoin completely uh, by hedging it on exchanges. I, I think they originally were wanted to do smart contracts on top of Bitcoin to make it completely decentralized, but now they're hedging on exchanges. So we'll have to see exactly how it works. But if you can do Bitcoin without the volatility, that's going to be a very powerful tool. It's like Venmo worldwide without restrictions. So I agree that all of these applications have huge potential, like specifically things like yours. Uh, they address really you know, hard problems that you know, people have been trying to solve for many years. Um, you know, I invite our listeners to go back uh, two episodes uh, to, uh, to listen to that if you haven't done so. Uh, Open Bazaar too, like you know, having a decentralized eBay it has, is a great thing um, and you know has a lot of potential, uh, especially in the developing world. Now the the it seems like a lot of these projects that have had Bitcoin integrated as a payment mechanism, the problem with it, I mean the the value uh, that uh, Bitcoin brings is this regulatory arbitrage and so this ena this enabler of permissionless innovation and, 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 and permissionless payments. But the, the issue is also Bitcoin. Like Bitcoin is all is at once the value and the problem because it's hard to get people into Bitcoin. Um, you know, there's still that friction between the financial, you know, traditional financial world and owning Bitcoin so that you can participate in these systems. Uh, so would you would you agree with that? And and if you do, what do you think finally needs to happen for all of these really great apps? Like there's all kinds, like we're just setting a few here, but there have been others that have died as well to make it into the mainstream and to go sort of um, go above this problem that that is getting people into Bitcoin. Yes. Yeah, so, and you guys talked to, to Charles, uh, Ryan about this uh, when you talked to him about yours. Uh, I would, it is difficult still to get Bitcoin. I would say, I just mentioned Abra, that could be an app where people want to use it because the volatility is gone. So it's, it, it just looks like dollars or euros or whatever on their phone. And uh, Coinbase and Circle kind of do this too, where you can hold, you don't need to use Bitcoin at all. So I, I think the key thing here is like these that you need to hide Bitcoin, basically. So, like, I, this is another another conversation I had with uh, Andrew from Purse. I told him, like, he shouldn't have Bitcoin or, like, mentioned at all on your website. It should just be deposit dollars to Coinbase, send it to Purse. It can be a Bitcoin transaction behind the scenes, and you get the discount, and you don't even know that Bitcoin was providing that discount. So there needs to be a lot more of that. That's something uh, I remember seeing a talk, uh, Brock Pierce and Terrence Yang, who uh, invest, their, their VCs were talking about this same concept uh, last year. Um, and it, there's also creative ways that you can give, give people like a little bit of Bitcoin. And I think Pop Chest is thinking about doing like the reverse of their system where instead of paying to watch a video, you get paid a little bit of Bitcoin to watch an advertisement. And when it comes to that kind of stuff where you're getting a little bit of Bitcoin in your wallet, I think that a lot of that relies on the Lightning Network because you're talking about those like micro or nano payments. So we might see more of that once Lightning uh, is active on the network. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that would be very interesting to see whether this, whether you're right, and whether this new generation of applications uh, really do break out. Uh, I think there certainly is. It's certainly the case that this original idea, why a lot of people got interested in Bitcoin and and all this possibility and potential is still there, and and the idea of a cryptocurrency, global cryptocurrency, uh, makes so much sense. So it. 
something like that, I think, is going to happen. And, and it would be great to see if some of those applications really manage to drive that. Yeah, I forgot to mention uh, BIP75, too. I don't know if you guys wanted to talk about that, but it's, it's finally solving that problem of having to, like, scan QR code or, like, writing down a Bitcoin address and, or copying, pasting it. Like, you're, we're almost at the point where it's going to be, like, an email address, so I'll be able to send Bitcoin to Brian at epicenterbitcoin.com and you'll get a return address with it. So there's BIP75 and BIP47, which is a more... BIP, BIP47 seems to have better protections when it comes to privacy and censorship resistance, although I'm not sure if the trade-offs will be enough for people to use that. But I just put up an article on that I've been working on on CoinJournal that compares the two, so I, I, I recommend people check that out. Okay, perfect. Well, we're going to link to this, certainly in the show notes. So, um, Kyle, thanks so much for coming on. It's It's been a pleasure talking with you, and it's all been a pleasure following your readings over the years, and we certainly look forward to many more fantastic articles. Also, by the way, thanks so much for all the great articles you've written about uh, episodes of this show, too. Yeah, you guys put out a lot of good content. So. <laughs> but, yeah, thanks, thanks for having me on and for this discussion. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna link to to Kyle's article uh, to, in in the show notes. Quite a few that we've talked about, and some other ones uh, as well. So you can check them out for anyone who hasn't been following uh, his articles. Uh, I highly recommend that you do so. He really is, uh, as far as I can tell, at least uh, the best writer on uh, Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrencies. So, and to our listeners, thanks so much for listening. Uh, so, Epicenter is part of the LTB network. You can find this show and lots of others at letstalkbitcoin.com. Of course, you can also subscribe to the show uh, and get it every Monday. And do so either via your favorite podcast application or via uh, video on uh, youtube.com slash Epicenter Bitcoin. And uh, thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.